Hello everyone. Before we begin with the stories, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed. We finally reached 1,000 subscribers. This is such a big milestone for me and I wanted to say thank you for subscribing and staying with me. In honor of this milestone, I have compiled seven of Scare Diaries original stories. Thank you again and enjoy our creepy stories. The Tooth Fairy Every little kid beams with excitement when they lose that first tooth. It's the first step from child to young adult and you get money to buy whatever you want. I heard stories at school about some kids getting a toothbrush and some sugarless gum. I believe in my heart that my tooth fairy wouldn't stick it to me like that, especially since I had met my tooth fairy long before I lost my first tooth. Yeah, that's right. The tooth fairy would come visit me in my bedroom. Some kids described the fairy like Tinkerbell. I figured since there were so many kids in the world, maybe there was more than one fairy because mine <laughs> looked nothing like what the other kids described. Mine was about three feet tall, skinny, very skinny, like you could see all his bones. His eyes were sunk into his face with thick, dark circles around each eye socket. His head was bald with sporadic patches of hair clinging to his scalp. He moved in a disfigured way, like one leg was shorter than the other. His teeth were quite disgusting. Most of them were gray and rotted. His breath smelled like a dead animal, a cat, to be more specific, that I found dead roadside while riding my bike. I figured he took my tooth and would give it to a kid who could not grow teeth, even though he probably should have kept it for himself. I first began to see the fairy in the form of a shadow. I awoke to my mom and dad in the hallway. Mom was putting towels in the hall closet. From my bed, I could only see their shadowy silhouettes on the wall. I am an only child, so I knew mom and dad were alone in the hallway. I watched a shadowy shape slowly detach itself from my mother's shadow. It began moving toward my room. With every step, it shrunk in size. By the time it got to my door, it was about three feet tall and walked like a monkey would. I shook with fear, unable to understand how this could be. That when the shadow's head turned, as if it was looking at me. Terrified, I just stared. Then it raised an arm and began to wave. I screamed as loud as I could. It dropped down on all fours. Again, like a monkey, it scurried up the wall and stopped on the ceiling. My parents came running down the hall to my room. As they passed under the shadow, it turned into a black haze and attached itself to my father this time. Mom ran to my bedside while Dad stood in the doorway. My speech was slowed by my crying, but with all my might, I didn't stop until I had described everything that just happened. Mom hugged me with those comforting mom words, It's okay, baby. Dad shook his head and told me I'll have nightmares throughout my whole life. They're not real. Learn how to deal with it. He turned and went downstairs. It seemed a little cold coming from him. Usually he has a very loving demeanor. Maybe he was just tired. Mom assured me everything would be okay. She dried my eyes and told me to get some sleep and remember it's not real. That night, as I laid sleepless, I heard a noise near my bedroom door. My room was dimly lit by a small nightlight. I tried to focus on the noise, but my eyes couldn't see past the darkness. I looked to the ceiling. There it was, the shadow. I repeated to myself, it's not real, it's not real. Then I thought that's only if you're dreaming. 
Suddenly, it scurried down the wall, much like how it went up the wall earlier. I thought about Dad. Let's try that man-up thing. I think I can be brave. In a fake, confident voice, I asked the only thing that could make sense. Are you the tooth fairy? From the darkness, it said, yes. I told it I had not lost a tooth yet. I began to smell the dead cat smell. I pulled my blanket up enough to try and filter the smell to my nose. Out of the darkness, the fairy appeared, just as I described him. He began walking around my room with that odd walk. His body really swayed from side to side. He moved slowly, just circling my room. I thought maybe he was waiting for one of my teeth. He probably knows when they're going to fall out. Suddenly, the door began to open. In the blink of an eye, the fairy became a shadow and frantically climbed the wall to the upper corner of my room. It stayed motionless as the door opened the rest of the way. It was my dad looking in on me. In his old cheerful voice, he said he couldn't believe I was still up and he thought he heard me talking to someone. He laughed and came to my bedside and gave me a big hug and a kiss on the head. That's my little buddy, he said. Then he told me to try to get some sleep. I told him I loved him and he hugged me even harder. I love you too. Good night, my son. He turned and gently closed my door. I stared at the shadow in the corner until I fell asleep. This became the new normal while I slept. I would awake at random times to find the tooth fairy walking in circles around my room. I would quietly say, nothing yet, maybe tomorrow. Then I would close my eyes and go back to sleep. Finally, after my many fruitless nights, one of my teeth began to loosen. I was so excited, probably more for the fairy because I knew how patient he had been. I worked at it every chance I could. I may have even made it fall out quicker than it was supposed to. When it finally came out, I was uncontrollable. My mom and dad instructed me how to put it under my pillow so the tooth fairy would come. And don't forget, they said, if you're not sleeping, the fairy won't come. I wasn't sure if that was true since I would see him almost every night. Not willing to chance it, I ran extra laps in gym class to tire myself out. That night, I placed my tooth under my pillow, and without trying, I fell right to sleep. The next morning, I immediately looked under my pillow. Sure enough, there was a dollar bill and one of my favorite candy bars. I knew that despite his odd appearance and his foul smell, my tooth fairy came through for me. However, from that day on, I never seen or smelled him again. Tooth after tooth, I received the same surprise. One day at breakfast, I finally told my parents how I miss not seeing the tooth fairy anymore, and I hope he's not mad at me. My parents both had this look of confusion on their faces. My dad shook his head and told me it was time to tell me about the tooth fairy. After he explained his and mom's part in the game, uh, I was more confused than ever. If that was them, then what was in my room night after night? The thought sent chills through my body. I asked if they were sure. Mom showed me my tooth and said we could go to the store and get me a cool toy with the tooth money I've collected. I lay in bed wondering if this will be the night he comes to visit. It is odd how my fear has turned to anticipation. What should I be afraid of? Now, I think of him as an odd older brother like other kids have. In my prayers, I have even asked to see him again. I hope he comes to see me soon. As I lay in my bed, my room feels empty. His circular pacing now seems comforting to me. Night after night, I lay in my bed terrified of the evil that might hurt or kill me without him guarding my sleep.
my wife's new friend. My wife has a new friend. We'll call Carrie for reasons of this story raising people's interest in her. It's better we don't use her real name. Carrie is a really sweet gal, very mild-mannered and always a smile on her face. I understood immediately why my wife became friends with her and how the friendship grew so fast. One day while I was at work, my wife called and said that her and Carrie had lunch today. Well, that's great, I said. Then she said Carrie invited her to visit a psychic who she sees regularly. As I am not a believer, I laughed and said, (laughs) Should be entertaining, have fun. She said it's a psychic who's going to speak with the deceased. You can say dead people, it's cool. Just don't bring home any dead guys looking for a place to live. I laughed and told her to have fun. When I got home, my wife pulled in behind me normal greetings, how was your day, etc. Over dinner, she told me about the psychic. Only one spirit made contact, a young boy named Caden. His father, Jonathan, about a 50-year-old man who looked to be emotionally drained, timidly sat, squeezing the edge of the table while swaying side to side in a nervous motion. He begged her to contact his son. He said he couldn't take it anymore. He had to know the truth. My wife said she got the sense that the man was afraid of his son. As the questions started with, are you okay, and worked up to, how did mommy die? Caden responded, mommy was mean. How was she mean, his father cautiously asked. She wouldn't play with me. Mommy's health was poor, son. She often felt too sick to play. In an angry, deeper tone, Caden replied, She will play with me whenever I want now. Childish giggles echoed throughout the room. Suddenly, the psychic trembled and said, He's gone. What did he mean? she asked. My wife and my son both died in a fire in our basement. The coroner said a fire spread over the carpet, engulfing the entire basement in flames. The fire burned so hot that very little of my wife could be identified. Next to my wife was a burnt couch. Caden was found lying on it, untouched by the flames. His cause of death was undetermined. There wasn't a mark on him. He didn't even have smoke in his lungs. I never knew how the fire got started. I lost everything that day. I couldn't contain my laughter any longer. That's just good entertainment, I told her. You know, like wrestling. She shook her head in disgust and told me she truly felt the presence of that boy. I tried to contain my laughter as she stormed out of the room. I sat alone giggling, picturing this fake seance with some out-of-work actor and some kid learning how to con people with lies. Little Caden was probably off stage playing video games while he read his lines, or some adult who can sound like a kid. Little did I know at the time, things can be more real than you would ever want them to be. The following day, we got a call from Carrie. She said her mother had become very ill and she needed Carrie to come care for her and her father. Both were quite old and had many health problems. She didn't know how long she'd be gone and asked if we could take care of her cat, Princess. Princess was a good cat, but we were dog people so she couldn't stay with us. We opted for going to her house each day and spending some time with her. I hadn't played with any cats since I was a kid. We lived in the country and our barn was like the local motel for all the cats in the area. Cats would show up and hang around for a week or two, then we wouldn't see them for a month. Some wild, some friendly. I did enjoy their company while I did my chores. Point is, I was excited about taking care of Princess. It sounded like fun. The first few days, everything went great. On the third day, we got the storm of all storms. 40 miles in each direction, people were without power. Fallen trees riddled the streets and yards as far as the eyes could see. After the storm passed, I was happy to see the damage to our property was minimal. 
After a little cleanup, we decided to go check on Carrie's place. It was a slow drive with quite a few detours. As I pulled in, her home seemed to have dodged the storm. However, like all her neighbors, she was without power. I grabbed a flashlight from the glove box and headed in. Princess was not the kind of cat to meet you at the door. She was more of a hide-and-seek kind of gal. As we called her name while looking in the usual places, I noticed an echo coming from the basement. I paused and looked at my wife. At the same time, we both said, Did you hear that? Princess, I said in a medium tone. Sure enough, someone in the basement repeated, Princess, in a similar tone. We're not alone, I said quietly. My wife grabbed her phone and started to call the police. No, I said. Maybe it's a neighbor or relative checking on the cat. Think positive. I opened the basement door. Is anyone down there? I asked. There was no response. In a louder, more aggressive voice, I said, Who's there? After a few seconds, I said, Princess. From the darkness, someone responded, Princess. Then a child's giggle came up the stairs and (laughs) sent a shiver over my whole body. I shined my light down the staircase, but no one was there. Then a voice said, Go. Just then, Princess leaped from the darkness onto the stairs. She stopped halfway up, looked back, and let out a hissing growl toward the darkness. Then she ran past me like she was on fire. Who's there? I demanded. Quit screwing around. I shined my light side to side. Suddenly, from behind me, a voice said, I don't like your light. Turn it off. Now. The door at the top of the stairs slammed closed. I could hear Gail struggling to try and open it. Who are you? I said. Why are you down here? I was playing with Princess, the childish voice responded. It sounded like a little boy, maybe five or six years old. I shined my light side to side across the basement, but no one was there. You ruined playtime. Princess won't play anymore, and it's all your fault. I don't like you. I spun around, shining my light in every direction. The basement was empty, yet the voice seemed right next to me. Suddenly, the basement door flung open. My wife descended the stairs faster than I'd ever seen her move. She reached the bottom with another flashlight. I'm okay, I told her, but something isn't right down here. We stood silent for what felt like forever. Then the voice said, I saw you with my daddy. You looked sad. My wife frantically shined her light over the entire basement. Quietly, I asked, What's your name? Why are you down here? After a moment, the voice said, I want to play. I stepped in front and said, Of course, I'll play with you, while motioning for my wife to get upstairs. No, I want to play with her. Will you play with me, Mommy? We both froze in astonishment. I still couldn't believe this was real. I kept expecting someone to jump out and say it was all a joke. Constantly shining my light over the basement and seeing nothing, I finally caved and said, Caden, Is that you? I knew you play, he said. Then in a more demanding tone, he said, Because you know what will happen if you don't. Quickly reverting back to the child's voice, he said, Caden and Mommy love playing. No play here. We play at home. Just then, the power came back on. We both jumped at the instant brightening of the basement. We could see everything. We were alone, but we knew moments earlier we weren't. We both called Caden's name, but there was no response. We raced up the stairs and out to my truck. 
I thought about Princess and if she'd be okay. I realized she had escaped Caden once. I wasn't sure if we could say the same thing. W what about Princess? That cat's on her own unless you want to go back in there, I said. Her look confirmed she had no interest in going back for the cat. In a matter of minutes, we were miles away from Carrie's house. Neither of us knew what to say. I didn't know whether to call a cop or a priest. Up to this point, I wasn't a believer in the supernatural, but that crushed all of my disbeliefs. I called Carrie immediately when we got home. She seemed less than surprised. She actually laughed. She said Caden had been visiting her since the seance and that spirits will often follow people home after seances. They'll only stay until they find someone else. My whole body froze. Is that what he meant when he said play at home? Had he chosen us? Then she said, you might want to go away for a few days and have someone come take care of your dog. She thanked me and quickly hung up. As I stared at the front door of our home, I felt sure my wife's new friend was waiting for us on the other side. The Family Business I'm 32 years old. I'm a computer designer, and I won't be in the same building with anyone who's dead. Oh yeah, my name is Ryan. None of that means much right now, but later, you'll understand. As a child, I had loving parents, a swing set, and my best dog, Petey. I should have been truly happy. The only problem was what was in our basement. My family owned a funeral home. The funeral home was four miles down the road. It was a beautiful building, very soothing to help people deal with their recent loss. However, it wasn't very big and it didn't have a basement. For that reason, the basement at our house was where my dad prepared the recently deceased for their showing. In a nutshell, we always had dead people in our basement. My dad tried to make it a little less creepy by saying, Son, don't think of them as dead. Think of them as sleeping. These are good people who need our help with the last stage of their lives. Pretty sound advice, don't you think? Well, with that in mind, I was able to move about and help my dad. In retrospect, I had seen things no 12-year-old should ever see. Our next-door neighbor, Mrs. Phillips, was an old widow who always watched me when I was outside. She hated Petey the most, always making mean comments and dirty looks toward him. Mom said, ignore her, son. She'll get hers one day. So, that's what I did. One Saturday, Petey got stuck in the fence between our properties. He screeched in pain. As I ran to him, I could see Mrs. Phillips smiling. Soon she began to laugh. My rage boiled over as I yelled, Don't worry, you'll get yours one day. Her laughter turned to a sadistic smile. Then she winked at me and went in the house. Dad looked Petey over and said he had only had a scrape on his leg and that he'd be fine. I wondered what kind of cold, heartless person could have laughed at that? And don't get me going on that creepy smile followed by a wink. I decided there were happier things to think about and put it behind me. Over the next four years, I worked as hard as I could for my father's attention. He was a very closed man. I knew he loved me, but he had a hard time showing it. I constantly did odd jobs around the house to help free up his time. Unfortunately, he filled his free time with more work. He had his heart set on a large building in town. Once converted to a funeral home, he said he could accommodate up to four funerals at once and could perform pre-showing preparations there instead of our basement. That part I was very in favor of. The summer I turned 15, Dad really started grooming me for the family business. I didn't care for it, but it did allow Dad and I to become closer. I welcomed his new laughter and many stories I never heard as a child. It was mid-June. 
Dad and I had been working in the basement all day, and we finally finished up. I showered and went right to bed. That night, I awoke to a lot of noise and flashing lights outside. I put the pillow over my head and went to sleep, thinking it was a dream. The next morning, Mom said there was a horrible accident next door. Mrs. Phillips had fallen down the basement stairs and died from the fall. After police reports were completed and it was ruled an accident, Mrs. Phillips was sent to us. Dad asked if this bothered me. It didn't, but I knew what he wanted to hear. No, she just needs our help, I said. That's my boy, Dad said with delight. Although I was older, I still hated that miserable old lady. Since my comment that day, she said I threatened her life and I need to be put in jail. Whenever I did something that she didn't like, she was quick to remind me of it. I watched as he began the proceedings. As he was draining her body of fluids, I could see the hospital gown covering her slowly sink closer and closer to the large stainless steel embalming table like she was being deflated. The phone rang. He had been on the phone for a while as I stared at Mrs. Phillips. This heartless woman, who I had grown to hate. Suddenly, with no warning, she sat up. I screamed. Dad told the person on the phone to hold on. Easy, son. It's just rigor mortis. Remember what I told you. Now help Mrs. Phillips lay back down. He turned and went back to the phone. I couldn't disappoint him, so I placed a hand on her leg and the other on her shoulder. She felt cold and deflated, like her skin would tear if I squeezed too tight. Holding my hands open and flat with a considerable amount of pressure, I forced her back down while saying, It's okay, Mrs. Phillips. I'm just going to lay you back down. Once she was laying flat again, I said, Now, isn't that more comfortable? Dad turned and gave me a big smile, then turned back to his call. Just then, I looked at Mrs. Phillips' face. Her eyes were open. I could see her wrinkled skin starting to sag because her fluids were almost gone. Just then, she smiled. That same sadistical smile she gave when Petey was in pain. I completely froze. Then she winked the same way she did that day. Slowly, her arm began to rise toward my face. I turned and ran away as fast as I could. I never went down in that basement again. I buried myself in computers to avoid human contact. I swore I'd never go near another dead person. The image still haunts my sleep. 22 years later, and I still awake drenched in sweat, heart pounding from that horrible day. And each time, the smell of death fills my senses as I scramble to turn on the light. They say we all have our demons. Mrs. Phillips is mine. The love of my life. I consider myself a very special man. Lucky, if you will. My personality is a little quirky. I've never been able to connect with other people. Being an introvert, I don't possess the social skills learned through interactions with others. All of my life, I've felt alone until that day I first saw Lindsay. I never felt so drawn to someone. She was amazing, like an angel sent just for me. I immediately knew we would be together for the rest of our lives. It was like every time she smiled, it was just for me. No one else in the world mattered. I get it. I'm pouring it on pretty thick, but if you could see Lindsay the way I do, you would totally understand. I've been with her for a year. Our anniversary is in about a week. I've planned a secret surprise for her. She's going to be so happy. I got up the other morning. She was already in the kitchen making coffee. Her long, caramel-highlighted hair rolled down her shoulders like a waterfall. 
As she turned and smiled, my morning was complete. I just stared. She let out a morning yawn and said, Oh, I better get the kids up. She's so punctual, always worried about being late for something. As I looked into the kids' room, she was frantically getting them ready. Ben and Joey are twins. They're six years old, but have opposite personalities. Ben is a busybody, always on the go like his mama, where Joey is quiet and more reserved like me. The boys aren't mine, but I love them both as much as if they were. You might even call me overprotective, but I wouldn't care. I would never let anyone hurt them. Anyone home? A woman's voice called from the front of the house. Yeah, Ma, we're in the boys' room, Lindsay replied. Lindsay's mom, or Nana, as the boys like to call her, arrives each morning at exactly 7.15 to take the boys to school. I swear you could set your watch by her. I'm sure that's why Lindsay tries so hard to be on time. She's not that focused of a person, but she tries really hard, and that's good enough for me. After breakfast, Nana loaded the boys in the car, and they were off. Lindsay plopped down in her favorite kitchen chair with her coffee, French vanilla. She loves that stuff. Normally, she sits and enjoys the quiet, but today, she had something on her mind. She needed to talk about work, she said. Apparently, there's a new guy named Stephen, and he's acting inappropriate and suggesting things that him and her should do. Things that I wouldn't even repeat. Instantly, I felt my blood boil. I became so enraged, I don't even remember the rest of what she said. I just knew Stephen would regret the day he took that job. The rest of the day, I couldn't focus on anything. I just knew I needed to pay Stephen a visit. Lindsay's work backed up to an alley. It was very dim, and the only people that went out there were the men who had to smoke. The women smokers went out front because the alley had a creepy feel to it. I hid in the alley during work hours to see if Stephen was a smoker. To my delight, he was, and the first one to light up in the morning. It was as if a greater power knew he needed to be corrected. All night, I plotted my attack. First thing in the morning, I hid behind a dumpster. The dumpster was full and there was garbage stacked on either side. This made it difficult to conceal myself from view. I feared a garbage truck might pull up and reveal my hiding spot. Like clockwork, he came out for his morning smoke. With his back toward me, I hit him in the back of his head with my fists. Before I could see his face, he fell to the ground. I began kicking him as hard as I could. As he rolled over, I saw the look of panic on his face. She's mine, I yelled. My rage completely consumed me. Two steps to my right was a pile of old computer equipment that was to be taken by the garbage men. I reached down and grabbed an old computer tower. It was surprisingly heavy with eight very pointed corners. With a firm hold of it, I jumped on top of Stephen and began smashing the computer tower on the pavement next to his face. With each blow, I felt the tower get closer and closer to his face. I felt the tenseness of his body. I stood up and told him to learn how to talk to a lady. Then I walked away, not once looking back. He was left with the garbage, and I felt that to be appropriate. When I got home, I had to shower quickly before anyone came home. Afterwards, I laid down and took a nap. Lindsay got home first. She was absolutely frantic about what happened to Stephen. She said he'd been attacked in the back alley and no one knew why. I stayed perfectly silent and just listened. By the time Nana brought the boys home, not another word of it was said. If the boys overheard something like that, they could be scared for life. I wanted so badly to let her know it was me and I did it for her, but then I thought, Real heroes don't do it for the recognition. They just do it, and that's what I did. After about a week, she didn't seem to want to talk about it anymore. I was happy for that because, honestly, 
I was getting tired of hearing about it. I thought to myself, Saturday is our anniversary. It's not like a wedding anniversary. It is the day Cupid put a bullseye on this guy's heart. I think she could use a surprise. You know, something to let her know she's truly loved more than anyone on this earth. Saturday evening, I laid in bed rehearsing the words a man says when he's ready to commit. I was so nervous I had to lay perfectly still. I wanted her to fall asleep, then awake to my kiss on her soft lips. It would be perfect. I carefully kept looking to see if she had fallen asleep. Finally, she did. I had to be perfectly quiet so I didn't wake the boys. Over the past year, I had memorized where every creaky floorboard was. I cautiously navigated them. Finally, I had made it to her bedside. As I stood over her, I thought to myself how she looked like an angel so peacefully asleep. I stood for a few minutes. I just couldn't wake her. Suddenly, a scream came from the hallway. Daddy, there's a man in your bedroom. The broken silence set me on high alert, not knowing what was happening. I turned to see Joey in the hallway, screaming and pointing. In a split second, a massive force hit me from the dark. We fell to the floor. He struck me repeatedly. I tried to fight back, but it was clear I was losing. After a few more hits to the face, everything went dark. I must have gone out for a while. I awoke to a large man in a police uniform slapping me in the face. Come on, dirtbag, wake up. You're not going downtown in a cushy ambulance. You don't deserve it. Wake up, you piece of garbage, he said. The street was lit with red and blue lights flashing in every direction. Despite the pain of my beating, I tried to pull away from the man. That's when I realized my legs and wrists had been handcuffed to an ambulance gurney. I couldn't move. He got in my face and said he found my makeshift bedroom in the attic and all my little peepholes I drilled through the ceiling throughout the house so I could watch. Then he smacked me again and asked, What makes me think I could do that? By the looks of your little room, it looks like you've been up there for a while. He smiled and said he couldn't believe her husband didn't kill me. If I were standing over his wife, I'd be in the coroner's van. With a final shove, he told me to count my blessings and called me a sleazy pervert as he walked away. I closed my eyes to the image of Lindsay. From that day forward... The memories would be all I'd have. But when I get out, and I will get out, Lindsay will have the life I've always dreamed of. Gretchen. I'm 15 years old, a totally average kid, or young man as my dad calls me. Me and dad are close. I mean... He's close with my sister, too, but he's not real good at girl stuff. I guess that's why our time together seems easier for him. You know, compared to when he's with my sister. I try to pick up his slack by making time for her when he can't. Since Mom died, I think she feels alone. Mom was the best. She loved her family. She always knew when to talk and when to listen. Our whole family revolved around her. It's like Her love made you feel special, so you wanted to be near her. I know, cheesy, but true. We all took it very hard when she passed. October will make a year she has been gone. For the most part, it has just been day by day. We always try to do silly little things to keep her memory alive, like antique shows and garage sales. These were two of Mom's favorites. Before she died, it was like pulling teeth to get me, sis, and dad to go with her. She rarely bought anything. I think she just enjoyed the time with her family. I always thought, who would want this old crap? To her and dad, maybe it was a walk down memory lane. Table after table, 
mounded with memories of simpler times. Now that she's gone, we still frequent the sales. Only now, when Dad says, Who wants to go look at other people's garbage? We race to the car like small children going for ice cream. Some people visit their loved one's grave. We visit antique shows selling useless crap. All for the love of Mom. So now that you have a pretty good picture of my life, we'll go back to mid-May. It was a Saturday. I was chilling in my room, about to beat my top score on Monster Hunter, Sunbreak, to any fellow gamers. I noticed Dad was a little quiet during breakfast. I sensed he may have been missing Mom. I didn't say anything until he came in my room, sat down, and asked if he could play. Something about Dad? He doesn't play video games. He doesn't like video games, but I know when he's missing Mom. I walked my character up to Rethylos and accepted my fate. With a fiery blast from his mouth, my hunter was instantly engulfed in flames. My health dropped to zero, and it was game over. Dad looked confused. He told me, I'm not sure, but I think you might be dead, son. Yeah, a little bit, I told him. <laughs> my heart sunk in my chest. I was so close. But for Dad, I'll sacrifice the quest and my best score. Quickly, I sat up and said, this is dumb anyway. What say we go look at some garbage? You know, that other people think is gold. A big smile came to his face. I'd like that, he told me. He said my sister is at her girlfriend's house. Should we wait for her? I shook my head no. Her loss, I said. We might find that big blue diamond from the Titanic. It'll be a bargain for four bucks. <laughs> we laughed. Before long, we were neck deep in smelly antiques, corn dogs, and roasted almonds, but I do like those. We walked up and down the rows of tables. Suddenly, Dad stopped in mid-sentence. He stood like a statue, staring at a table full of dolls. Without asking, I walked past him straight to the table. Behind the table sat a tall, thin man. Immediately, he smiled. It scared the crap out of me. His smile was just like the Joker from Batman. With his ear-to-ear -ear smile, he asked what he could do for me. Tell me about those dolls, I responded. He smiled that creepy-ass grin and began his sales pitch. Did I mention he had a piercing stare that also creeped the hell out of me? It was like he was looking directly into my soul, and he liked what he was looking at. Still, I pretended to be interested. I figured it would make a funny story for my sister. Dad pushed me aside and picked up a large doll on the center of the table. Great choice! My new creepy friend commented. Then he began to tell some fake story about this doll being from Berlin during the German War. He said some German doll maker was killed because of this doll. Hitler's mistress collected porcelain dolls. The doll was a prototype. Only one in existence. It was the centerpiece of her collection. She worried the doll maker would make another one. She insisted... Hers must be the only one. Hitler ordered the execution of the doll maker. Shortly after, bombers destroyed the building with her and all her belongings. Only a handful of items were salvaged. This doll was one of them. I'll give you a couple of minutes to wrap your head around that like I had to. Old Creepy could sure make up a story. I nudged Dad and said, What do you think, big guy? You buying this crap? I think we should hold out for that diamond from the Titanic. Dad never broke his stare from the doll. It's all true, he said. Your mother was searching for this doll since she was a kid. Her name is Gretchen. I think Dad could have said her name was Oprah, and Creepy would have went with it to get the sale. Then he got real serious and said he had to warn us. A curse follows this doll. He said, we won't get to choose Gretchen. Gretchen must choose us. Three vendors tried to own her before him. All three had catastrophic events in their lives. One lost all his belongings.
to a fire. One became paralyzed during the night. The last one died. His eyes never changed, but the creepy smile faded as he said that Gretchen chose him, so everything has been fine. He put his hand on the doll and said in an unsettling tone, Gretchen must choose you. Then he said to walk away. If she's still here at the end of the day, then she's chosen you. I laughed. How much do you want for Gretchen the voodoo doll? He leaned in and said we would talk about that at the end of the day. Dad remained quiet. Without so much as a thank you, he turned and started walking toward another table. Is it just me or was that guy really weird? I said. Never looking at me, Dad said, Yeah, a little weird. For the next two hours, we rummaged through the tables. After a while, Dad cheered up and began to joke around like we always do. The show was over at five o'clock. Dad said it was time to go. I wondered if he would go back for Gretchen. I certainly wasn't going to suggest it. Dad stopped and turned toward the doll vendor's table. He looked unsure. Then he shook it off and said, We should go. We loaded into the truck and started to drive toward the exit. A loud bang from the passenger side window brought us to a halt. Next to the truck was the creepy doll guy. With one hand he was slapping the window, and the other hand was Gretchen. With that creepy stare and that unnerving smile, he told us we could not leave. You've been chosen, he said. I rolled down the window. He continued, you have to take her. She chose you. Then he handed the doll to me through the open window. He had it cradled like a father holding his newborn, then handed it to me the same way. With one hand, I went to grab it by its head. No, he yelled. Hold her like me. She is very delicate, like you would a newborn baby. Okay, I responded. With both hands, I cautiously cradled the doll. Dad asked what we owed him. He bowed his head and said thank you. She has chosen you and released me. Then he turned and began to quickly walk away. I yelled one more time, What do we owe you? He looked back with a quick glance, then broke into a full run in the opposite direction of us. I looked at Dad and asked if he had ever seen anything like that before. He assured me he had not. Then he said, maybe the guy was on drugs. That would explain his disposition. We both laughed. I looked out the window again and that's when I realized I was still holding this doll cradled in my arms like it was my newborn child. I shook my head in disbelief, grabbed the doll by its face and threw it into the back seat. Careful! Dad said. You don't want her to regret choosing us. Yeah, we don't want that, I said. We both started laughing. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the whole truck was thrown sideways with a horrific crash. Glass exploded throughout the inside of the truck. Out of reflex, I closed my eyes until the truck came to a stop. When I opened them, there was a large piece of steel protruding through the window opening. As I turned my head to check Dad, I felt it just starting to cut into my neck. I froze perfectly still, looking straight forward. Are you okay? I asked. I could hear Dad moaning as he shifted positions. Holy crap, son, are you okay? He asked. Yeah, I'm good. Give, give me a minute. I carefully reached my hand down to the power seat button. With a deep breath, I pushed it rearward. Immediately, the seat moved back. I was free from the knife-like piece of steel that gave me a three-inch scar on my neck, not to mention the psychological one that I still carry to this day. First responders surrounded the car. I told them we were both okay, but what the hell happened? One of them said we were T-boned by a runaway semi-truck. I turned my head toward the right. The entire side of the truck had been crushed. 
Four inches from my ear was a massive steel grill with the word Mac at the top of it. On impact, one of the steel fins distorted and became the giant knife blade that almost ended me. Let's just say it destroyed car rides for me, and I avoid them whenever possible. Luckily, Dad and I were both fine. Responders helped Dad from the wreckage as I waited my turn. That's when I looked in the back seat. Gretchen was sitting upright in the middle of the back seat. Her head was slightly turned, so she was looking right at me. To go from lying flat to sitting upright with her head turned toward me? Well, let's just say it disturbed me a little. Within a couple of minutes, Dad and I were both being checked out by paramedics. Apparently, the driver of the semi-truck had fallen asleep causing the accident. He was unharmed as well. While Dad and I were recalling our near-death experience, a female police officer walked up. Her arms were positioned like she was holding a baby. When she got closer, she asked if I had a sister. I nodded yes. A smile came over her face. She said she thought so. What a lucky little girl to have such a beautiful doll. Then she leaned in and whispered in my ear that I should be more careful. This lovely little doll will be treated nicely. She very carefully handed Gretchen to me. When I reached with one hand, she pulled back aggressively. No, she said in a commanding voice. Both hands, like you would for a baby. I extended both hands and Gretchen was handed off like a newborn in the hospital. I questioned if that truck hit us harder than I thought. I looked over at Dad. He had the same look of disbelief with me. Nope. It was real. The officer brushed Gretchen's hair to one side with her fingers. Then she let out a giggle that sounded <laughs> like it came from a five-year-old girl. I said, thanks, I think. The officer turned and began to walk away. I heard the giggle again. <laughs> when I looked up, she was skipping toward her police car, again like a child on the playground without a care in the world. Dad called my uncle to come pick us up. He was there in a matter of minutes. I have always liked my Uncle Joe. We screwed around all the time. His first response was, Are you guys okay? We both said, Yeah. Then he looked at me and said, Nice dolly. Did Daddy buy you that? That's when I realized I was holding it like I was its mother. I struggled for a response. Shut up, I said. It was weak, but it was all I could come up with. He laughed and said, Come on, bro. Let me take you and my niece home. I don't have a car seat. Is that okay? Then Dad told him to lighten up. He almost died. Uncle smiled and put his hand on my shoulder. He said, Come on. Let's get you guys home. With a brief sweep, he took Gretchen from my hands. Like earlier, he opened the rear door and tossed her in the back seat. I got in the opposite side. I sat in the back seat staring at Gretchen lying face down on the seat. Suddenly, I just caved. I picked her up, fixed her hair, sat her upright, and buckled her in. Dad heard the click of the seatbelt. He turned and thanked me. That was bothering me too, he said. He smiled, turned toward my uncle, and asked how work was going. I could see uncle's look in the rearview mirror. He looked confused. Sure you don't want to go to the hospital? Dad said we were good, and how's work? The rest of the ride was filled with small talk. Before long, Uncle was gone, and it was just me and Dad. Oh, and Gretchen. We were both unsure how to feel about all the strange events that seemed to happen once Gretchen became ours, or we became hers, however you want to look at it. Either way, we couldn't make sense of it. When my sister got home, we told her about the accident. Only the accident. There was no mention of Gretchen. Dad thought it would be better if she didn't know. He said he needed some time to figure out what to do. He made Gretchen my responsibility. A responsibility I don't take lightly. She stays in my room. I found a large box. It took an entire Saturday to convert it into a home for her, or a dollhouse, some might say. There's a couch, a kitchen table and chairs, 
and windows with curtains. I even drew pictures of our family, her included, framed them, and hung it on a wall in her new house. She spends the day in her dollhouse while I'm at school. Nighttime, she sleeps in my bed. I always tell her she's pretty and brush her hair. I can only hope she's happy. It terrifies me to think what might happen if she's not. You know, thinking about it, I guess Gretchen did well choosing us. Always say goodbye. To be clear, this is a warning. The story is only to help you understand how easily your life and loved ones can be taken. No one is beyond the grasp of the darkness. We all fear it. It was eight days before Christmas. Holiday cheers seemed to be amping up throughout my friends and family. I was feeling like it was going to be a nice Christmas. I had finished 90% of my shopping and the other 10% I knew what to get. I just had to go get it. Miss Gillespie was an elderly woman who lived next door. She was quite possibly the sweetest, most giving person I had ever met, always making sweet treats for my family and I. She was a Holocaust survivor. Over the years, I had listened to fascinating stories about her life. During these stories, many photos were shared, mostly black and white. Some stories were sad, but she preferred to focus on the good ones. The story that always stays with me is the one about her tea parties as a young girl with her favorite doll, Beatrice. She had an old black and white photo of her and Beatrice at a small table enjoying some fake tea. She would always say she wished she still had Beatrice. Then she'd laugh and say, we were best friends, you know. And that's when the little girl giggle would always come out. The thought of it always makes me smile. One day I was out finishing my shopping when I saw her. Sitting in a second-hand store front window was Beatrice. I rushed in and bought her. She was in pristine condition. I could see why Miss Gillespie was drawn to her. She had a very kind smile. I was very excited to get home and wrap her. After a bit of a stressful ride home with holiday shoppers everywhere, I turned down my street and was horrified by the sight of police and EMS in front of Miss Gillespie's house. I rushed to the nearest first responder. What happened? I asked. He told me she had had a terrible fall. I'm sorry, he said, but she didn't make it. My heart sunk in my chest. I stood in the yard for a bit, just trying to wrap my head around it. As the cold began to set in, I told myself to go home. I kept thinking that I never got to say goodbye. I didn't think her passing would affect me like this, but I had never lost anyone. Christmas came and went. I tried to be the happy, cheerful person I was, but inside, I just wanted to tell her how special she was. Sometimes people do things they normally wouldn't do when you're grieving. This is where I went off the rails. I went back to the secondhand store. I went to the attendant and asked if they had any old Ouija boards because I'd like to buy one. Certainly, she responded. She reached under the counter and pulled out a large black velvet bag with a rosary tied to it. She loosened the drawstring and pulled out a very dated-looking Ouija board. She said she keeps it in a blessed bag so spirits can't escape their realm. We stared into each other's eyes. Then she busted out laughing. <laughs> just kidding, that's how I got it, she said. I just like to see the look on people's faces when I tell them that. I chuckled and said, uh, I'll, I'll take it. Wasn't long and I was back home. I went to the basement to avoid attention. I placed the board in the center of an old folding table. Directly behind it, I sat Beatrice. I placed my fingers on the planchette. There were no instructions, so I tried what I learned in every cheesy horror movie about witch boards, aka Ouija boards. I started by asking if Miss Gillespie would talk to me. I waited, but no response. Are you okay? I asked. Still, 
no movement. I thought to myself, this must be a game of patience. I completely relaxed and just stared at Beatrice. As my heart rate slowed, the planchette began to move. It moved at a much slower rate than what I had seen in the movies, but letter by letter, it spelled out a message. I literally held my breath. As it came to stop with the final letter of the message, I exhaled. Welcome us, was the message. Just then, Beatrice fell from the table. It scared the crap out of me. I told myself that it had to be me. Maybe I got so scared I bumped the table. I quickly bagged the board and planchette. I even remember pulling the drawstring as tight as it could go. Beatrice went back into an old box I had found for her. I opened a cupboard and placed them both inside. I walked away and wouldn't look back. Six days passed with no disturbances. On the seventh day, I was at home working in my office paying bills. I felt I was being watched. I looked into the family room. There was a black shape peeking around a door frame at me. I sat still and just watched. It never approached. It just watched. Finally, in an angry tone, I said, Who are you? As quick as I finished my sentence, it was gone. From that point, these dark shapes seemed to come in waves. Sometimes, as many as four were watching me. Home, work, outside, even the grocery store. I never felt alone. Obviously, not the outcome I had hoped for when I tried to visit Miss Gillespie. I knew I opened a door, and I didn't know how to close it. A close friend was very knowledgeable about religion. I called him for advice. After a five-minute verbal scolding about not knowing what entities you're contacting, he finally asked if I placed the planchette on the goodbye message on the board. I told him I wondered what that was for. He shook his head in disgust. That's the only way to end the session or close the door, as you say. Well, now you know how to fix it. I just hope it's not too late. He made a cross gesture with his hand, then said, Go fix this. Don't wait. Go now and stop playing with things you know nothing about. I walked away wondering what I invited into this world. When I got home, I started to feel sick. All I wanted to do was lay down. I pushed myself to go to the basement. As I pulled the board from its bag, the nausea in my stomach unleashed. I vomited all over the table and the board. When I looked up, I saw the dark shapes across the table. I was sure they didn't want to go back. I placed a planchette over the goodbye portion of the board. Miss Gillespie, if you can hear me, please know we miss you and we love you. Goodbye and goodbye to any who are here that don't belong here. Please move on. I opened my eyes and the shapes were gone. I know you always feel better after you throw up, but my nausea was gone as well. I returned to the secondhand store with the board and Beatrice, and yes, I washed and sanitized them. The store clerk asked if I wanted a refund. I said no, I'd just like to donate this stuff. She thanked me, and I left. I haven't seen any dark entities since, but I can't help but look over my shoulder from time to time. My advice is always say goodbye, especially to the ones you love. My warning is, don't ever play with a Ouija board. It's the devil's game. Always trust your gut. I want to say the first time I was at my house, my mom came home from work and she had three women with her. Two of them I knew from her work. I had never met the third one. I happily said hello. All four were laughing and giggling about work-related silliness. Then my mom remembered I hadn't met the new lady. Honey, this is Lily. She's new at our work. When I stepped closer to shake her hand, 
There was a gray haze around her. I rubbed my eyes and looked at the other women. They looked fine. But when I looked at Lily, I seen this gray haze. She must have sensed my stares and became uncomfortable. She suggested it was time to leave. I tried to say it was nice to meet you, but I, I couldn't say the words. I instantly began to feel a sick feeling in my stomach. My mother picked up on my demeanor. She shuffled the women out the door and immediately asked me what was wrong. I told her I didn't know, but when I got close to Lily, I got a bad feeling. My mom told me I was being ridiculous. I said, I don't know if she's a bad person or if she's done some bad things. I know I don't trust her, and you shouldn't either. She shook her head at me and said she was a grown woman and capable of picking her own friends. I let it go and went to my room. About two weeks went by. Mom came home in tears. Me and Dad tried to comfort her. Apparently, Lily lied and tried to get my mom fired so she could take my mom's position with a substantial pay increase. My mom was very well-liked and respected, so her plan failed. After that, I began to sense when a person was less than honest. Another time, I had gone to a tanning salon. I was greeted by an older lady and a slightly younger man. They introduced themselves as the owners of the salon. As I stepped up to the counter, my stomach became sore like I had been doing sit-ups. I cradled my stomach with my free hand, and when I looked up, the man and woman were both surrounded by the gray haze, just like before. I immediately put my wallet back in my purse and left without saying a word. I told my dad about what happened. Trust your gut, he said. Three days later, my dad came in my room with a newspaper. That's some gut you got, honey, he said as he dropped the paper on my bed. The headline read, Owners of Tanning Salon Arrested for Secretly Filming Young Girls. Oh, my jaw dropped. That's where I was going to go. Yeah, I know, he said angrily. Always trust your gut. Now, I don't know how many other people experience this sort of thing. I mean, it's not like I see dead people or anything. I think I'm just a normal girl, but over the years, I know I have avoided some bad situations involving bad people. Most recently, I had an experience that scared the crap out of me. At this point, I'm married with two wonderful sons. I was at our local shopping mart with a full cart of groceries. I began to get that feeling that I was being watched. People moved up and down the aisles, making it harder to tell who it was. I didn't know how, but I knew I had a stalker. I rolled my cart into the main aisle. I walked up and down it, looking down each aisle. People would look up, but then return to their shopping. A middle-aged man near the alcohol aisle angrily stared at me. He was dressed in dark clothes, wearing sunglasses inside the store. It was 7.30 p.m. There was no need for sunglasses. He was not a large man. He just looked shifty. He never broke his stare. My total focus was on his face. I looked side to side so I could get a full scope around him. That's when I saw it. Only this time the haze was not gray. It looked like black smoke or fog swirling around him. Immediately, my stomach began to tighten into knots. I pretended to be looking for a sale item and went to another aisle. I had put four aisles between us, but the moment I looked up, there he was, only much closer than before. Casually, I checked my grocery list and moved to another aisle, this time at the other end of the store. I watched him walk the main aisle, looking in every direction. Then he grabbed his phone and started talking to someone pointing at the front door. Through the front window of the store, I could see three men standing alongside a white work van. All three men wore dark clothes and looked as shifty as this guy. One of them came into the store and the first guy nodded his head to him and pointed to the aisle I was in. He began to head toward me. The first guy circled down to the other end of my aisle. I played out every scenario in my head that I could think of. They didn't work for the store. That was obvious. I've been hit on before. 
These guys were creepy and aggressive, so I knew he wasn't an admirer. As the second one got closer, he put on a pair of black gloves and sunglasses. The black aura swirled around him like a sandstorm. Just then, a very large guy pushed a cart full of groceries from another aisle into my aisle. He was built pretty well and had a military haircut. He almost ran into my cart. I am so sorry, he said. I was distracted by my two-page shopping list. I assured him it was no problem. When I looked to see where the two men were, they had both stopped and were waiting to see if I knew this guy with the cart. As he got ready to go past me, I said, Sir, I think I have a problem that I don't know what to do about. He instantly turned around with a look of concern. He said it looked like something was wrong, but he didn't know if he should ask. Quietly, I told him about the two men. Really? he exclaimed. He said we should see how serious they are. He told me to go down the next aisle by myself. He assured me he would not let me out of his sight. I did as he said. The moment I entered the empty aisle, the two were back on the move, heading toward me. My heart began to race. Then I heard, Honey, did you say you wanted 2% or vitamin D? I turned to see the big guy pushing his cart toward me. I smiled and replied, You know that vitamin D is bad for your cholesterol? We both laughed. The two men had stopped just short of us. He looked at them and said, Hey guys, you finding everything you want? They turned and went toward the exit. Unbelievable, he said. Those two were up to no good. He told me to finish my shopping and he would walk me to my car. I told him I didn't care about groceries. No, no, he said. If you do that, they win, and we can't have that. I told him I was done and that I just wanted to go home. He told me he was done too. He wanted me to call my husband and be talking to him as we walked to my car. After we both paid for our groceries, I did what he said. As we exited the store, the side door of the van was open. One guy was in the driver's seat and the other three were standing to the side of the van. All four stared intently at us. Eyes forward, he said. Nothing to see. I laughed and looked straight ahead. We got to my car and I was still talking with my husband on the phone. As I threw the groceries in my car, he stood to the side and just waited. Suddenly, I heard squealing tires. I looked up to see the van leaving. It tore down the street like a rocket. Well, I guess they're done shopping, he said. Don't worry, I got their plate number, and FYI, I'm an off-duty officer. I just had to make sure you were safe. Technically, they didn't break any laws, but I was hoping. He smiled. I handed him my phone so my husband could tell him how much we appreciated what he had done for us. He said no problem, but he wanted to go so he could run their plate and surprise them with a visit. I thanked him again, and he was off. Coincidentally, he left the parking lot the same way they did, in the same direction. When I sat in my car, it all hit me. What could have happened if I didn't see the warnings, or if that officer had not been shopping today? I started to shake and felt the tears building. Then I remembered what he said. No, no. Then they win. I took a deep breath, put my car in gear, and pulled out of the parking lot, coincidentally the same way they did, but in the opposite direction.